Hello and welcome to This Connect. This is our third episode. And we've changed things a bit because you said you'd like to see a change. You wanted it brighter? Well, here it is. And today we are talking about change. We're talking about anoptenium. Vehicles that you should really be driving and riding already in this country, but you're not. I mean, to me, it makes absolute sense to have them in India, not just for people like us. I think the brands would do well from it as well. So there's added impetus for that. So this is about common sense and horse sense. I think absolutely And so. therefore a lot of nonsense. That we'll get to any which ways because that's the underlying layer, right? Okay, so before we begin, I want to give a quick shout out to the Boeing 747. So the last 747 just rolled off the assembly line in Seattle. And the 747, it's a graceful old aircraft. We'll have them around for a while. They'll be in the skies for, I think, 10, 12 years more or something. But a little part of my heart just broke when I read that. Okay, we'll get on. Let's really break hearts now. Yeah. So let's start with Toyota. Is it the same thought? Japan, Tokyo, Motor Show. Twin Drink Motegi, Go-Kart Circuit. And a lift. And the lift. So we were together uh, and uh, Akio Toyota had just taken over the company and the tagline at that point, I don't remember the exact words, was let's make Toyota fun again. Right? Uh, yeah, yes, it does remind me of Make America Great Again too, but two different trajectories for sure. So this is one of the rare occasions where like Shumi would be happy to talk about cars and that was quite an epic trip. Um, and that lift is particularly interesting because both of us remember that moment because we were in some kind of headquarters or whatever, one of the offices of Toyota and we were taking a lift to go up to a building and it's all very serious and formal and of course very uh, Japanese in the sense of how everything's been organized so you're like, you know, on your best behavior and you get into the lift and there's that one poster saying, let's make driving fun again. Yeah, that's the exact line, yes. Yeah, and then we get into that meeting where it's all suits and you're just like, it doesn't fit. But back then, I think that message was just so important. Yeah. Because I don't think, I mean, Toyota makes a lot of sense. You respect the products, but fun, I don't think that came into the picture at all then. And that trip, what did we do? You spoke about Twin Ring Motegi, which was practically where we went straight from the airport. It mm -hmm. was a long bus drive between the airport and Twin Ring Motegi. But we practically went straight there. And... So there was a car there called, which I like to call the Fatty 86, which eventually be called, became the Get the 86 <laughs> and the FT 86. I think the T stands for Toyota. I'm not sure what the F stands for. But the Hachiroka coming back, we drove that at a go-kart circuit. And in those, what, 15 minutes we got with that car, it was such an impressively happy, joyful little car to drive. It was also very compact. So you could quite imagine punting it around in Indian traffic. The and beauty of that car, the entire idea of that car is that you don't have to go fast to get thrills. And I think that is just perfect for our environment. You know, the tires were from the Prius, right? So low rolling resistance, not very wide, so not super grippy. And everything about it was meant to be like, it's frisky and it's not serious horsepower, right? And therefore not very expensive as well. So. So get an Innova. Oh my God, look at the silence that we both achieved in that moment. Oh my God. I mean, if you had the option of buying an FT86 or the G GT86, or as it is known now, the GR86, if you could have that, 230 horsepower, Boxer 4, simple, low slung car, and the interiors are apparently just as tacky as well, the other mass market. Uh, they're tacky, but they last forever because they're from Toyota. Yeah. Imagine having that <laughs> next to your Innova. Imagine that. That would be super cool. You'd look at that and say, that's a Toyota. And that's a Toyota. Yeah, but you can't do that because Toyota refuses to sell us that car. And you know what the really sad part is? It might not be around for long. The, even the GR86, which came out recently, might be only there for another couple of years. So Toyota, in case you're listening, I'd make do with the Supra as well. If you want to bring it around. Okay, are we done? Shall we move on? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, Q for you. When we were there, we also drove the LFA. And they had the engine on display and it had a plaque on the side as to who made the engine. 
Do you remember that? Yeah, the Fasino guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Fasino and the LFA are sisters. It's true. Yamaha's been making engines for Toyota for a really long time and some other brands as well. And the LFA's <laughs> engine was made by Yamaha. Nice segue, but the fact of the matter is, what are you up to, Yamaha? I mean, really, what are you up to? You really think that the tuning fork for us is scooters? Okay, you need to do volumes and you need to sell scooters for it. I get it. You have the Aerox and it's a very nice scooter, but you fail to tune the suspension for our conditions. Everybody has to run 5 PSI lower than stock to make it work. People are importing kits from Indonesia to make them work. And this, to me, is just not Yamaha. The R15 is Yamaha, the FZ16 is Yamaha, and after that, nothing is Yamaha. When you gave us the MT-09 test bike, the day after that, you launched the updated model of the MT-09 and obsoleted the capitalized MT-09 the next actual day. I'm horrified. And, think, and look, I'm not going to bash Yamaha here because I'm a huge this fan. Is, this is not a rant. My earliest memories are of the RD350. I had two of them and I loved them. And to me, I was blue inside. My, my blood was blue uh, until KTM happened. Then my blood was orange and both are still boiling. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that you refused to sell us everything that we wanted. Hmm. Where's the MT-09? Where's the push? Where's the MT-07? I rode that in New Zealand. Tenere. In, yeah, I mean, by now, I would expect Yamaha to actually make amends rather than launch new products. I want it fixed. So I want all the 9s, I want all the 7s, I want all the cool motorcycles you make. I think Yamaha, interestingly, went through this phase where they were kind of picking a direction and it seemed like it was going to tip back in the direction of <laughs> revs your hearts and then it tipped the other way of let's save your wallet, right? And it's not even revving your sales, is it? I mean... I mean, I don't know. I think the Fascino is a well-made product. It's, I think I'm not doubting the quality of the product. I'm not doubting the product planning's yeah. decisions and what they've done. Absolutely. I'm just saying as a direction. I'm saying why can't they commit? Why does this seesaw have to happen? This seesaw happened when we went from two strokes to four strokes. Right? And then they came back. It was like Yama. You remember that moment at yes, Auto Expo was, when yeah. they showed those two motorcycles and that was a bolt out of the blue. Yeah. Nobody expected, nobody even thought that Yamaha would do something like that. And they did. And that fueled their growth, I mean, since then to now. I mean, if you think about it, the FZ still sells today. The R15 in what, version 4 now, still sells, has that audience which loves it, respects it. It's worked for them. That voice of Yamaha... I think if John Abraham was the product planner, even then the product line would have been more strong. Hmm. And Sinky knows nothing about how to react to that. And I love it. We'll be, we're going to be talking about those things in another podcast soon. So what do you expect from Yamaha? What do I expect? To be honest, now I've stopped expecting. What comes, I just take with grace and gratefulness and say that, oh, right, thank you for bringing that. But you do realize how terrible a situation that is when you're saying a brand that I love, I give up on. Absolutely. And I say whatever they gave is okay. What I mean by that is, no longer on my radar when I'm thinking of motorcycles that will excite me is that little blue icon sitting there, right? If they manage to surprise us, I will be thrilled. But I am done with waiting and, you know, hoping. It's not there. Like when we rode the MT-09, right? What a fantastic motorcycle. And until then, the benchmarks were so clear cut for me. And that bike came out of nowhere. It changed my thinking. I mean, yeah. that's what it was. It changed what I thought was great for that segment. And Street Triple is a fantastic benchmark. But I went back thinking that, wow. Yeah, that there are others that we really need to have here, right? Other ways of doing this while still having the same kind of madness mm -hmm. and ability. And the madness in that was fantastic. I mean, so why the MT-09 is not properly on offer in India? Why is the MT-07? I mean, MT-07? Yeah. All the 7s, actually. The R7, the MT, the Tenere. I mean, simple two-cylinder construction. I mean, simpler compared to the triples and would therefore be more affordable. And Japanese, so they'll never break. Yeah. Yeah, you know this, right? Japanese engineering hadn't, hasn't figured out how engines break at all. They, they haven't learned that process yet. Mm -hmm. So their bikes just run. 
This is a small example and I think a lot of you should think about it. If you have an R15, think about the rear shock. It's non-adjustable. They did it the more expensive way, but they did it in a manner that it just works. Yeah. That's a link mono shock. It's not cheap. It's not easy to do. And on that category of motorcycle, they did it. That's incredible. Yeah. So these are the guys who also made the LFA engine moving along. Yeah. Honda. Oh. Oh my god. I mean I'm I'm actually uh, going to take a pause. And here. cars and motorcycles both are. Huh? Oh wow. Your pause just got bigger. Yeah, because Honda Oh my god, where do I start? Motorcycles <laughs> or cars? Civic Type R, I think. Civic Type R, right. I f- forget Civic Type R, just the Civic. Yeah. Right? Just the Civic. They brought it to India and I I'm not kidding you. I I do this every time I see a Civic on the road in my head if I'm on a motorcycle in my in my head I'm giving that guy a high five. If I'm crossing a Civic, I will always turn to see who's driving. Mm. I think the combination of the engine and the gearbox just made no sense to me. <laughs> the petrol could have been a manual and the diesel could have been an automatic whatever right but they did it um, the other way it, yeah because that chassis is fantastic it's fantastic i mean you and you know a chassis we are talking about all this as though you know a chassis i can ch- sense the strength no it's about how it talks to you and it does talk to you you can feel how it's weighing up the outside wheels how it's going into a corner it's fantastic so when is the civic type r coming Oh man with, with Honda I have genuinely drawn a blank. I know we were supposed to come up with stuff. I think the only thing you can go out with saying is hey can we have the NSX and they were genuinely considering the NSX mm. right for India at one point. But I think they need to get the bread and butter sorted and I'd be happy if that happened first and foremost. So Honda's solution for the moment is okay let's just get the basics right first. I definitely. Think okay so. let's move to the motorcycles and let's make this a little bit more fun. You you should know that i'm not the kind of person who generally favors hondas they are a little bit too neutral and a little bit too subtle for my taste i'm not that guy right when i rode the africa twin i thought they'd achieved something special because it was a category of motorcycle that takes me to off road places which i'm a little bit scared of where having neutral and subtle is actually a good thing and i really enjoyed my time on the africa twin hmm. at that point there was only the dct i went to malaysia for this uh, really strange event Uh, where I don't really know what was going on, but there were lots of motorcycles to ride. I rode the manual Africa Twin there, and I understood that we had the worst Africa Twin, <laughs> the more convenient Africa Twin perhaps, but the worst one. And I was okay because now that's been fixed. In the process, Honda raised their prices, and as soon as I say prices, I know you guys are laughing, right? Because the motorcycle that excited me the most continuously over the five or six years, whenever uh-huh. I've had a chance to ride it, is the CB500X. I think it's an absolutely spectacularly good motorcycle. and then honda showed that they really know how to price motorcycles well this might sound like a little bit of repetition but to clarify things you remember when honda first made a big stride in india cbr 250 yeah the squandered stride as i like to call it because back then the promise was we are going to manufacture the cbr 250r here in india yep right and because of the free trade agreement with thailand we'll get parts from there and all of that so it made sense that you're going to grow this ecosystem so therefore you'd be able to cater to the indian enthusiast better has that happened yeah everybody else is catering to the enthusiasts that honda has forgotten about so they've not really developed that plan further right they didn't develop the plan at all i remember going to the bira circuit riding that bike coming here riding that bike again and since then it's received both an led headlight i think along the way that's it we got the cbr 150 as well we did Yeah. You remember it? I remember it because I was flummoxed. I was like, "Is this exactly the same motorcycle as the 250?" Because the design <laughs> the it was very dis- similar. Yeah, it was like it's. It was literally like they took the design in Photoshop and they say scale it down 10 percent. I think that 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 was about it. Yeah, but it, it was, was not exactly the same. But honestly, I didn't enjoy riding it enough to even remember it. The 150? Yeah, I mean, I had, I don't know that there is a picture of Arti with the KTM and there is a CBR 150R in the background that day because I think we were testing it at that point of time. That's my only memory of that motorcycle. Yeah. Completely failed to make an impression. The Malaysian CB 150, yeah. uh, which is the liquid cooled one with all of that, that was really impressive. Mm. That's not what we got though. Yeah. Right. But the CBR 250R, I think, is a symptom. 
that Honda is so busy trying to get the volume sorted and the Activa is doing so much work for them that they're literally blinded to the rest of the picture. Right. Which is why I don't think any of their motorcycles really work as of today, right? There are some motorcycles which have little pockets of followings. But which Indian Honda can you really say is like the Honda or a Honda from the global stable? I mean, your f world's favorite motorcycle to not ride is a Honda right now, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Which one? I would... I would not ride the Highness. Yeah? Because it's not a Honda. Yeah. I mean, it's a very strong statement, but we both conquer exactly on this. From everything we know about what Honda's motorcycles do, whatever little the CB350 does, it's not what Honda's do. And if there's one motorcycle, I think there are two motorcycles that I've never really bothered to recommend to people. One is the Dominar, because I think that motorcycle needs to be a heck of a lot better. And the other is the Highness, because for whatever little it does, it's not a Honda. Okay, compose yourself while we move on to their big wing operation where none of the prices make sense. I mean, the Africa Twin is, for me, a sweetheart. And the manual. Hands down, there's no two ways about yeah. it. I mean, I understand the convenience of the DCT, but I don't know, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking to commute in the city, and one time when I did have it, somebody said, ha, huh, the 900cc Activa. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> no, but in fact, I saw the other side. Anand uh, Dharmaraj, my friend, he took the Africa Twin DCT into Ladakh. I was supposed to go that year, but I broke my foot. Hmm. Ironically, on the Africa Twin launch. Huh. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he said that the DCT didn't work for him because every time he'd take a difficult shortcut, hmm. when the shortcut plateaued even a little bit, the DCT would move to second. Hmm. But then when it became steep again, mm. he'd be out of power. Mm. So eventually he was doing all of that work in the manual mode anyway. Right. So he says, so therefore the extra money I spent for the DCT, the 15 kilos extra I'm constantly carrying around. Exactly. It doesn't add up. I think that weight was the thing that was bothering me because it seems like a small amount, but it's sitting all the way up ahead, right? right. It's right there. And I don't think that really worked for the motorcycle. At least it didn't work for me. I'm not an expert off-road rider. So I'm always looking for motorcycles that give me the sense of ease when I'm riding off-road. Uh, and the Africa Twin, to a large part, does that beautifully. And if I had a manual gearbox on it, I think it would be uh, superb. Okay, so we've done a lot of motorcycles now, so let's switch tack. Yeah. Octavia VRS. Oh, man. You know, this is a particular... <laughs> this is going to be a particularly painful point right now for a lot of people because uh, it's possible that the Octavia is not on sale come uh, March 2023 because of the new emission norms, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the Octavia in the sedans, I think, is a gem, right? And the VRS has such a strong following. And that, as well, has had um, a bit of a rough run with the last one that came to India, the 245, because of the pricing. Mm. The pricing, I think, has been upsetting a lot of... Uh, Apple Card, so to speak, and uh, the VRS was something like that. So, is it possible that there would be a manufacturer out there who would say, here's a halo car that we need to bring in, for whatever brand values and associations it would create, mm -hmm. and then not immediately try to shaft the enthusiast with a price? Is it possible that there's a manufacturer who would say, we should get the GTI or the VRS or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and give it a reasonable upgrade price from the regular car, yeah. so that when you bring that into the family, you bring the brand home and then there is a strong and powerful emotional connect with the brand which the brand can then utilize over the next 10 or 15 years to generate more revenue from this family. Right. Would that not be a reasonable way to do it or is this just something that is so obvious to me but there is a reason why it's non-obvious to everybody else? I, this is a bloody good question, man. Because, and sometimes, are there enough car people or nuts in the world working in these companies is the question that I come up with, right? Are there enough people really willing to push this agenda, right, internally? I know of some companies and people who are there who are just crazy about cars. And it's fascinating to meet them because they're always trying to push. So let's do a good thing for these people in these companies. What are your favorite companies to deal with in terms of their packed with enthusiasts? Right. What's the top company that comes to your uh, mind when you say a car company full of enthusiasts who love their cars. Ford used to be one. Ford was packed with people 
who just loved cars and you saw it in india you saw it globally i mean you, you use the line you know my blood ran blue so they have a line they say i bleed blue right that was their standard thing right because they were out and out car guys in that sense so it was it was always fascinating talking to them about uh, cars i mean whether they are cars or any other cars it was always very very interesting about that somebody who's still there in india somebody who's still there in india i think now as a i would call them a young company in that sense like mahindra i think now when you see them hmm. you see the team that's now building the new range of products you see guys who are really hooked in they've got their teeth into what they're doing hmm. and it's fascinating yeah right it's fascinating to see grown men talking about engineering products to world class levels and just geeking out over stuff and you're like dude this is crazy you know like i need a notebook to sit down and talk about everything i mean to write down everything you're talking about because this is like a this is like a crash course and there's 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 a bit of heart there right there's a mm-hmm. little bit of sense of caution but i think there's also a lot of heart there saying that yeah we are we are young in this but we're thinking big and we want to do big stuff so it's it's a really beautiful thing to see because it's so human in that sense because we're always looking at them as companies and mahindra is huge in india right so yeah. you look at it as mahindra but when they're out doing this project and thinking about their future it's like yeah we we we, we want to do this we're going to do this and there's that yeah let's do this right and my disappointment is huge because it's the exact opposite of this when we meet the indian two wheeler guys by and large mm. so people like tvs are exceptions to this rule uh, some of the startups are also exceptions to this rule but there are genuinely yeah. geeky enthusiasts in there who are either engineering enthusiasts or two wheeler enthusiasts usually both right but by and large the people we meet are not two wheeler enthusiasts a large part of the two wheeler industry doesn't even i'm going to say know how to ride a two wheeler they might know how to operate the levers and how to balance and not fall off right they know how to operate a side stand do you do you want to talk about ktm europe for a second here dude that company is just crazy okay so i met them for the longest duration during the 390 duke launch at uh, martighofen uh, so just outside salzburg and you get introduced to r&d and you realize that ktm r&d has some clause in there that everybody has to actively be racing right and the introductions are hilarious because they make you feel this small by the end of it because it's like oh this is jorg he heads this project or the other and he was german enduro champion from this year to this year but now he's retired and he's retired so this guy who's whatever some part of the project he's now the current champion and this guy races here and that guy races there he won that and they're all like that I, i'm i'm going to button here i'm going to talk about one of my i think it was my first international trip with ktm so basically it was a product presentation for the super duke when it came out and uh, my colleague then rishad cooper at autocar uh, he told me i want you to say hi to this guy at ktm and uh, he gave me his name and and he described him to me as such you look at him and you'll think he shouldn't be on a motorcycle he does belong near a motorcycle and that guy i kid you not you think of him as a nice sweet uncle who's going to sit and tell you stories but when he was on a motorcycle he yeah. was a demon he was a complete absolute madman yeah. he's pulling wheelies next to you at 100 km an hour and just rolling down the road yeah. and you're just like what they are a bunch of mad guys man yeah and which is why their motorcycles are the way they are absolutely and to me the key lesson there is that if people in organizations don't use the products that they make mm. and i understand that it's easier for cars because everybody drives yeah. and not everybody wants to ride india's weather is not the happiest place to ride a motorcycle and i think and with cars there's a natural advantage as well like it, to push a car you don't really have to work that hard right? right you you can do that and still get that sense of excitement and be an amateur whereas on a motorcycle to even do the basics of pushing you need to put a lot more effort into it so yeah. it's easier to really experience a car and therefore i think there should be more of uh, these enthusiasts uh, in companies car companies yeah car companies motorcycle companies i mean i know that the r&d guys right i know that the testing teams must sales guys marketing guys communications guys those teams i find very few people that kind of emotionally involved with motorcycles and i'm telling you it makes a difference 
Right. Okay, Royal Enfield is an organization where a lot of people genuinely ride motorcycles and when you meet them at launch events, their motorcycles can be classified as slow and old school, old hat, however you classify it. But the fact that they love their motorcycles inside Royal Enfield and beyond their own brand absolutely is absolutely obvious and it informs the conversation to a depth that is not normal. Yeah. KTM International does this natively, BMW International also does this natively. Indian teams I think you guys need to be riding motorcycles a hell of a lot more if you're going to work in that field. And I think uh, anybody who's in this line, you know they say the racetrack is the crucible of development of the future. You have to do that because unless and until you do that, yeah, you're not going to experience that thrill. You won't understand where the limits are and what a vehicle does when it gets to that limit. Everybody is, yes, they are commuting. But if we want this passion and joy of movement to spread, you've got to feel that. You've got to feel that. Only then can you build something that's greater, better, yeah, and more timeless. I I'll tell you this, and it's ironic and glorious at the same time, but the most enthusiastic motorcycle riders I've met, sometimes they come from places like Continental's development teams and Bosch's content, uh, development teams. Right. And not from an OEM. Right. I mean... What's going on? Uh, right? It's just wrong. But okay, we've gone on for a bit and we've made our point that there are lots of vehicles out there which we should really be getting. Right? Let's take a quick moment and say why aren't the companies doing it? There must be a reason why they're not thinking about this. Mm -hmm. What's their side of the picture by you? Um, I mean, it's. I think that's very easy to explain. It's not the easiest environment right now. Hmm. Developing a vehicle takes a lot of money. Right? There are long chains that need to be built to make a vehicle, right? And they're focused on products which are going to sell in the Indian market, which are critical to them for their, you know, everybody's got a boss, right? So everybody's got to answer to somebody. So whether you've done your job and met the expectations that way. And even when we are talking about these imports, right? We're talking about cars coming in. Uh, or bikes coming in, like the Tenere uh, or the GR86 that I'm talking about, it's easy to come and sell a product, right? But then you have to take care of it. You have to handhold that customer responsibly for the next seven years at the very least. Right. Right? No, 15 years is the Indian law. For the next uh, 15 years, fine. So for that, that means you have to maintain a supply chain for those parts, which is effective enough, which is quick enough to make sure that you, when you're using that motorcycle, are getting that pleasure unhindered. Yeah. Right? For that vehicle, for cars, right? And Indian conditions aren't easy. Absolutely. Right? It's going to take a lot more, right? Out of a vehicle dealing with our kinds of roads, weather conditions, dustiness, sure. all of that. Which means they have to make sure that it'll work well in India. So I think before even getting it to India, for a lot of the car companies, it's like, how roadworthy is it? How will it fare? How will it age? And that exercise in itself is, I think, a huge exercise. So, the difference between Karthik and me in our attitude is that Singhi is always the more uh, reasonable, more thought through, more thoughtful perspective. I'm going to say the simplest thing ever. I'm going to say, give me the choice. Okay, here's my logic. If you look at Triumph, Ducati, Ferrari, Lamborghini, their sales are in the hundreds a month, sometimes much, much lower. And they appear to be able to self-sustain a business model that is working for them, either on the assumption that they're making profits right now, or that the growth of our country's lifestyle and GDP, etc., etc., will accrue to profits in a few years' time from now. Hmm. To me, every manufacturer who says the halo car can't come to India for such reasons, or the halo bikes can't come here, or we can't price them correctly, is basically saying we are blind because of the volumes that we are already able to do without making the effort for the enthusiast. Mm. And here's the thing. The enthusiast will buy your vehicles for the rest of his life. The rest of the buyers are transactional buyers who will move on from your brand unless you give them something to stick with. And if you choose not to stick with us, the enthusiast, we will pay you back in the same coin. I'm really upset about this. Talking about upset... I've got one more that I really want to talk about. It's something that I have been uh, raging on silently since maybe 15 years. You only rage silently, so let's get on with it. Yeah. Okay, the Swift. 
I, I, I think it's been an iconic, he's having a nice laugh as usual. Yeah, okay, so the Swift, right? I think that is a benchmark car. It's a landmark car in India, and especially because it came from Maruti Suzuki, right? A company that was basically getting people on wheels in the most efficient, effective manner possible, right? And then this Swift comes in. The design was bonkers. Think about it. It was bonkers, and we lapped it up. And that car actually got fun to drive to the masses in India for the very first time in that sense, you it know, did. for our generation. And it was always like, why haven't they got the Swift to India? Why haven't they got the Swift spot? And some decade and a half later, I'm still in that zone. Why haven't they got the Swift spot to India? And now it's got a 130 odd PS engine. It could come. I mean, it could, it should, it should come. Please, somebody should be thinking about it. I think it will. The good I, thing is the Jimny is coming and I think that that's something a lot uh, of No, I, I think every vehicle that we're dreaming of eventually has to come to India. We are one of the fastest growing economies there is. We have one of the lowest penetration rates uh, of automobiles uh, in the world. <laughs> we have a growing GDP. We're already the fifth largest economy. Our lifestyles are getting better. Urbanization is going to pick up speed. I think by 2050, some 70% of us are supposed to be living in cities. Every sign I read says between the amount of people we've got, the amount of people who are going to become economically productive shortly, I don't think any manufacturer anywhere will have a choice about whether they want to participate in the Indian festival or not. Mm. And they will have to bring all of their products to, to be part. They should. Right? And what I'm going to ask you to do as the audience is hold your standards high. Do not give in because there is the continuum, which we'll discuss in another episode of nothing, something, and everything. When we have nothing, we start celebrating something. I'm saying we are done with that. We will only celebrate when we have everything. We're going to close this off. This has become a little bit long. So I'm going to He's leave you. really intense about this one. Eh? Yeah, I'm really upset about this. So I'm going to ask you a question. However old you are, how many ever years you've spent on the road with whatever vehicles you've thoroughly enjoyed, what's the one car or one motorcycle that had it been on sale in the country today, you would definitely have bought by now. And I'm not talking about keyboard racing and dreams. I'm talking about you would have committed real money to this vehicle if it had been on sale, but you couldn't because they wouldn't let you buy one. Oh. I want you to be dead serious about this. this. This has to be a conversation which manufacturers are looking at and I want you to show because they believe that if 10,000 people like a thing, one guy might show up in a showroom and the social media ratios are all skewed. I'm saying not here, not at Motorink. We are a dead serious community. And as a serious community, what would you have purchased with your own money by now had the manufacturer given you an option? Leave us a comment. And this is all fun, right? This is all lighthearted, yeah. <laughs> is it? Dead serious about motoring. Yeah, no, no, before, before I get carried away <laughs> any further. Uh, this is Disconnect. Disconnect. Disconnect.